Good morning, good morning, and thank you everyone for coming back to Harvard Law School, for those of you who were here yesterday, and uh, welcome to those who have not. My name is John Palfrey, and uh, I teach internet law and intellectual property here, and uh, have the great pleasure of working with many people in the room as um, uh, the director of the law library. Um, first off, uh, Carl, uh, I think it's appropriate that we make a big, big, big thank you to you at the end of this 15, and thank you particularly for bringing uh, this event here to Harvard, so I'd like to allow for you. In many ways, both personally and professionally, Carl, you embody the spirit of this effort and all that is good about the uh, possibility of the internet. And I'm very grateful that you're willing to um, work with schmucks like me that um, have uh, just uh, something less than less than that great commitment that you have. Um, uh, I think that the law.gov effort is something that is historically important. I think this is absolutely at the, um, the pinnacle of what we should be working on as a society right now. And without your leadership, we would just simply not be where we are. So thank you for that. Um, I want to thank also um, from our staff, Michelle Pierce, um, for her leadership in putting this event together and making uh, the Harvard Law School Library part of uh, this concluding event. Um, Carl put to me this question of, uh, is there a um, uh, a right to access in the law? Is this the right frame for, uh, for talking about this, this fundamental issue? And I wanted first to embrace the spirit of uh, the Law.gov process with this, which is I'm not going to give a half hour lecture on whether there's a right to um, access of, in uh, the law. That would be a mistake. Um, but it's going to be interactive, so everybody's now on notice um, that this is going to be a totally crowdsourced session. Um, but I think we should um, uh, start, with the, start with the frame. And the frame is um, that we're trying to put a document in front of the law school deans uh, in the United States, then to accomplish a uh, further goal. And the further goal, of course, is the, um, uh, the set of uh, principles that uh, Carl put forward uh, set in action, the availability of uh, primary law as defined um, in our country and ideally in an interoperable sense um, internationally. So um, that's our goal. But there's an interim point here, which is how do we convince um, law school deans to sign on to this document. And one of the things that Carl has, both in the preamble and then uh, embedded in principles, is this argument about um, it being a right. And if you're a law school dean, many of them are constitutionalists, others are not constitutionalists, but um, certainly think in, think in these terms. Um, I want us to work on how we should talk about this, um, this question, how we should put it in um, both a theoretical sense, but also in an instrumental sense. How should we put it to these deans as um, people who are going to carry this message um, out to the courts and others who are going to be the decision makers. Now, um, it seems to me there are three approaches to this question. And just so you know, I'm going to ask in a moment um, to have uh, a sense from this group which of the three approaches is the right one. Um, and then uh, hopefully uh, people will uh, take stands on these different points and we'll build out uh, something close to a consensus. Um, so with the basic question, is there a right um, to access in the law? Uh, in the manner that Carl puts forward, I think there are at least three ways to answer it. Um, so way number one is to say no. There's actually not a fundamental right to access in the law. Um, but it doesn't matter. Not having a right to something doesn't mean we shouldn't do it for all manner of other excellent reasons. So Lawrence Lessig yesterday gave many of those reasons. I think one of the more compelling reasons is a straight economic one, which is to say we create the law in lots of environments as digital documents. So imagine it's the clerk typing up the uh, opinion of a, um, uh, of a judge. That's a digital document. Initially, it's a Word document. Um, why is it that that's not put in an authenticated way uh, on the web immediately? Why isn't that, in fact, a much more efficient mode of getting information out than um, printing it up in something and making multiple versions and having lots of confusion as to which is the, um, the useful one. There's a very straightforward, simple economic argument saying um, when you go to electronic publishing, you actually save a great deal of money just on straight economics. Um, there's a variant of that which says, um, let's imagine it costs a little bit more to publish in this way, which I don't believe it does in the long run, but okay, so there's some startup costs, you have to pay attention to it. Um, if you do that, there will be greater economic benefits for the society for having done it. There are cited a couple of studies that have been done, there's obviously more work uh, to be done, but both primary and secondary materials being available 
then for innovation to happen on top of it creates jobs, creates opportunity, creates um, greater understanding, but on a straight economic basis, it's worth it to do this anyway. Um, and on and on. I think Larry's point about innovation, the kinds of things that creative people can do if they have the raw materials in the formats that Carl was talking about in an open way, will have such extraordinary benefits to society that it matters not one whit whether it's a right or not. Okay, so that's answer number one. No, it's not a fundamental right. It doesn't matter. We should do this anyway for other reasons. Um, answer number two is yes. In a strict sense, this is a fundamental right. In fact, this is in a strict sense that would be recognizable by uh, courts, recognizable by the uh, officials who have to make the decision to go down this road. Um, and what you should do, Carl, is in fact be launching a series of lawsuits. You should be using the mechanism of law itself to establish um, to uh, vindicate a series of uh, rights or a single right in access to information. This is fundamental to our democracy, um, making arguments that would be the creative type of arguments that constitutional lawyers make all the time. Perhaps it hinges this right to access to information um, on the requirement, the basic notion that um, ignorance of the law is no excuse for wrongdoing. Right? You could imagine a series of things that would be arguments that um, uh, take other aspects of the law and find ways that this argument about access to the um, law disallows people from exercising other key um, obligations in a society. You could imagine lots of ways to think about it, but um, may have to be creative, but yes, it's a fundamental right, and yes, your way forward is in the court system. And then I think there's a third answer, which is the mushy answer, somewhere between the two, which says, yes, it's a right, but it's not a right in a sense that is going to be recognized by the US Supreme Court or any other court that's going to matter. It's a right in a general sense. It's a right that we agree to as uh, participants in a process, um, that we as right-minded, small r, right-minded human beings, um, think is in fact um, something that we ought to do. It's not for the sort of purely instrumental, functional type reasons that I uh, mentioned initially, like economic benefits. Um, it's not a right in the sense of, okay, it's enshrined in the Constitution and you can get the Supreme Court to make um, the PACER paywall go down and so forth, right? Um, but it's a right in a general sense, and that should be part of our argument that we should be grounding our arguments in this general, maybe not court recognizable, but nonetheless hugely important, right? And maybe those go along with the kind of functional instrumental type arguments in uh, answer number one. Okay, so I'm gonna need a vote in a minute, and then those who put their hands up for different things um, may well be called on if nobody talks um, to um, make this, this is law professor's prerogative at the front of a law school classroom after all. Okay, so number one is, no, it's not a right, and it doesn't matter anyway, um, other reasons to do it. Two is, yes, it's a right, and it's something that Carl should invest some part of his time, and all of us as community members working on this, in a formal legal sense to go after. And again, it may not be that you win the lawsuit, but at least you bring it, right? You kick open the doors of justice um, on the basis of at least a close call kind of argument. Um, or three is, yes, it's a right, but don't go down the legal road. Use it just as a rhetorical uh, measure, a way to buttress other arguments. OK, so how many people go with number one, no, not a right? Can we vote more than once? Ah, uh, sure. <laughs> yes, you may. You may. You guys are difficult quarreling with the hypothetical. I'm from Chicago. So. Yeah, all right. That's <laughs> OK, so no, it's not a right, and it doesn't matter anyway. How many people vote for this? Two, three. Okay, so three votes for that. Number two, yes, it's a right, and yes, you should go down uh, formal paths, even if not successful, to press this right in a uh, literal sense. Uh, Eleven for that. So three for one. Eleven for the the, the second one, and the third one. Um, yes, it's a right in a general sense, but not in a right in a sense that a court would recognize. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I see thirteen. So I see one double counted. But otherwise, um, it's interesting. It's a very close call between two and three. All right. So um, who would, who will be willing in this uh, courtroom style law school classroom to make the case for number one of the three people who voted for that? Truly crowdsourcing, Mr. Bruce. I've been You've been called up. It's true. I, I, I have argued for a, a long time that a principal motivation for doing this is economic. 
Yes, that it's trade rights. That if people can't get access to this stuff, then on, on, on some level they, they can't do business. And I, I will confess to being a dual uh, number one and number three voter uh, simply because I don't think that in so many of the problems that we have with this are based in equally valid aspects of our system. Right? In so many of the practical problems, the, 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 the bizarre thing that is legal publishing in the United States exists the way that it does, and interoperability standards don't exist in the way that they don't, in large part because of the respect that we have for such fundamental things as judicial independence, which in this context starts to look a lot like judicial arguments a lot of the time, uh, and for separation of powers. You know, if, if, if I wanted to go at it with a wave of my wand, uh, impose interoperability on legal information in the United States tomorrow, who would I have to be to do that? Uh, Tom Bruce? <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, but but I mean, the the, the answer is really that, that you you can't, mm -hmm. and, and no one can. And in dealing with the kinds of people that you have to deal with to get to where you want to go, uh, I'm not sure that rights-based arguments, however valid they may be, and I have a great deal of respect for them, are really going to get there. Uh, and, and that is what makes me a sort of split number one, number three person. And is it because you don't think the argument is forceful, or is it because you don't think it will work? I think it reads like a lot of aspirational hot air to the sort of people who make the sort of decisions that we need to have made. And who are the people who have to make the decisions? So what's it's, the it's, universe of people? Oh, Lord, I mean, just, just where shall we begin? Right? Yeah, begin. But, I mean, it's, it's reporters of decisions. Uh, it's people who have the analogous function inside the legislative branches. Uh, I think that there's great belief that these things can be made to happen from the top down. But as, as we all know, there's tremendous uh, foot dragging in the IT staff. I think you're up against the sort of attitude that Carl said earlier that he had encountered of judges saying, hey, look, you know, we rule from Olympian detachment, and whoever wants to print that stuff up and spread it out to the public, hey, God bless them, but that's not what we do here. Uh, it's, it, it's the people who do do that, <laughs> that that we really most need to be talking to. And these four categories of people, the reporters of decisions, legislative analogs, the foot-dragging IT people, and the judges who are ruling from Olympian detachment, none of them find responsive, whether forceful or not, these rights-based arguments. That's your view? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And the kinds of things that they will find responsive are what? Uh, economic empowerment, anything that looks like it's putting money into the system. Uh, I mean, it would be illustrative, it would be interesting to know, and I don't, uh, my colleague Peter Martin does, exactly what the reasoning was in Arkansas for terminating credit reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, my guess is that it was seen as a budget cutting measure, but that they're now starting to try to induce other benefits as, as they gain experience with it. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, these, are, these, these are the kinds of people who have a very very good view of the system. I, I guess what I'm saying is that I don't think that coming through the door arguing about rights in 2010 with state level officials who are looking at the fact that their budgets are going to cut to the point where they're cutting print reports uh, is, is really going to be terribly bad. Other number one voters willing to build out the argument for them, whether or not you were also a number three voter. I think there are different audiences that need to be convinced. Um, so, for example, uh, when I went and saw Cass Sunstein at the Office of the Management and Budget, um, he was very impressed by the economic arguments, the fact that the federal government was spending tens of millions of dollars simply accessing the PACER system, um, the, the potential economic benefits, and that made a lot of sense to him. Um, the administrative office of the courts is very much driven by economics, and you know, the one thing that's going to impress the administrative office is going to be a congressional appropriation, and that's very much an economic argument. Um, and so I, I'm a believer that, that the economic argument is important, um, but you might need a little bit more than that, which is why I voted for all three. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think that embodies also your spirit, Carly. You vote for all of them. Everybody in, everybody in, working on different fronts. I think that's good. Well, the internet was built on the theory of let's throw it on the wall and see if it sticks. Yeah. So, um, and a lot of it seems to have stuck. Yeah. Some did, some did. Yeah, absolutely. There's some jello on all the walls around here, particularly the Berkman Center. It's marked up that way. <laughs> other number one voters or number one arguments? Are there other arguments beyond the economic, um, 
that, and the innovation one that Larry emphasized yesterday, that are arguments for law.gov that are not rights-based arguments? Are there functional ones? I just want to add on the economics. It would be interesting to take one state yep. and figure out what it would cost to do our dream. Mm -hmm. Because I think we don't know the answer to that question. If we knew that, then we're talking real dollars. To me, $10 million and $1 million are real different. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it, it seems to me that such a study would not only be what does the dream cost, but what will the dream benefit? What are the things that we might see derived from it? And what are competitive things? I mean, my sense in a state legislature is competition as between Massachusetts and other states is a powerful force. And if the possibility that it will generate benefits for the society and jobs and so forth are presumably good election year or even non-election year types of arguments. And you have to do what Carl did or whatever. You've got to figure out what we're already spending on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, What's the baseline? It's not just what it takes technologically to get it up there, people power or whatever, but what are we all spending to not have it there, so it's a little more complicated. You've got, you've got down there with it, though, yeah. I think a case study approach is the right one. There's a lot of isolated success stories out there, and going and interviewing those people and saying, you know, can we figure out, did you save money, did, how much did it cost you, and then doing it by anecdote, as opposed to, you know, how much does the system cost, because every system is going to be different. The, the worry about law.gov is that people embrace this and say, okay, well, this is good, we need standards and we need a standard piece of software. Let's form a group of all 50 states and all the executive agencies of the government and let's all agree on what that software is going to do. And 10 years from now, that study group is still going to be meeting. And so that, that's right. my big worry about this, is that they embrace it too much. There's got to be, but there's got to be sort of doing yeah. it as we go, for sure. Distributed. Yeah. Is Distributed doing. Yeah. Uh, John, participating in both of your arguments about you know, sort of economic empowerment but I think worth distinguishing is, is simply the idea of improving government operations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that also there's an economic piece to that. I mean, government is spending a ridiculous amount of money buying its own work product. Uh, there is also, you know, when you start looking at a, a nightmare, frankly, like, like regulations.gov, or, or as regulations.gov was the last time I, I looked at it, uh, there is a, a fabulous example of a way in which not formulating a metadata standard of some sort can, can render a system useless. Uh, there are 17 federal agencies that deal with food safety in, in some way. Uh, and you really cannot go into that thing and look across the federal docket and say, who's regulating food safety and how? Uh, it's just, it, it's practically impossible to do because of the way that that system is constructed. So Tom, I'm very sympathetic to this, but out in the hallway earlier, you were lamenting the number of DTDs that were uh, published by the Congress uh, seven or eight years ago. What's the What's the sort of happy medium between not promulgating, you know, any kind of a data standard and just way too many DTDs? Uh, well, unfortunately, what you're asking to do and what you're asking people to do in that setting, and it is not easy. Uh, you're you're asking agencies to abandon an exceptional. I mean, this is this this is this is true of every metadata project that has ever been done in every field everywhere. Uh, is is that the clients always sort of look up and say, well, you know, my stuff's different. And you know, wise metadata librarians look at it and say, like hell it is, uh, you know, up, up, up to a point. Uh, but there is actually some skill needed in, in sorting out what's different and what isn't. And at the moment, we have in, 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 in many federal projects and many other projects an excess of exceptionalism and not much looking at, okay, well, what's really the same? Now, in the EU, this problem has largely been solved. Uh, or at least they have tried very hard to do so because they have been under some compulsion since the unification of the currency and so forth and so on to really sort of get the regulatory stuff, uh, at least if not harmonized, then cross-retrievable. Uh, and so they could put a huge amount of effort mm -hmm. because it can be done. I, I'm really very interested in your argument that um, looks at how much the government is spending on its own work product. There's a, an analog to our discussions in law schools and other universities in the open access business, and in this sense I'm using open access as referring to scholarship, um, if you think about the development process, um, we are the talent, we are the people who write the articles, right? Um, we happen also to be the publishers, the law reviews and law journals are all published by law schools by and large, um, many of which we prop up financially in terms of um, subsidizing. Um, we are then primary, not exclusive, but primary customers of those through our libraries. We buy them back. Um, and yet somehow um, we can't get our act together to make this information available more so to the public through an open access and frankly cheaper model of doing it. It's sort of astonishing that um, we can't get out of our own way in this sense. And I think the government has a similar problem in Carl's open access zone of primary uh, legal materials. 
All right, so let's shift gears to number two. There are 11 of you. Oh, yes, sir. Well, I just have one comment. Yes, sir. Uh, since government operates, in some, to some extent, in response to interest groups, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I'm not any of the lawyers in the room. Um, there might be pushback from some lawyers' groups who are also high priests of law and making this accessible uh, makes them less valuable, argument. I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with that argument. I'm just saying that it might be made indirectly or indirectly. So we're talking about arguments that we can make to advance this. What is the, how can you flip that to um, how this, uh, what the insight you've got here uh, means in terms of Carl's argument? Oh, well, that's the hard part. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I, would, I would argue in response to that that if the law govern, I mean, is governing everybody and there should not, just, be, just because you can access the law doesn't mean you can uh, have the knowledge and experience that lawyers do of interpreting it and applying it. Um, and so that there'll still be something for lawyers to do. Mm, that's interesting. Well, that's a variant. Of, that's another functional argument, actually. Yeah, Tom. Actually, I could flip that, but uh, Richard Susskind already has. Uh -huh. uh, if, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at his stuff, uh, one of the points he makes is that, in fact, the legal system is a very scary thing for many people to approach. Uh, <coughs> unlike medicine, for example, uh, you, know, you, you don't really know you're going to need a lawyer until a lawyer tells you that you're going to need a lawyer. And that, for a lot of people, is, is, is kind of a scary thing. Uh, his view is, and I think I agree with this, that in hyper-regulated societies, uh, there really is a pent-up demand for what I guess we've always thought of in law schools under the heading of a kind of preventive law stretching back well into the 60s. Uh, that is enabled, in fact, when people do have easier access to the system. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like the guy who wants to fix his own roof until he finds out how hard it's going to be. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I actually think that, in fact, what we would see there is some liberation of demand for legal services once this stuff became more broadly available. Uh, the thing we don't know a lot about, and this comes under the heading of, of, of research, actually, is whether there actually is some sort of WebMD effect taking place in client interactions with lawyers at this point, and if so, what kind of an effect that's having. Uh, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that that sort of stuff is going on. There are a lot of people in the legal aid world fooling around with free service and advice models. There are people in, in, in legal services looking at what can simply be done by provision of information as opposed to interaction points. But I, I, I don't, it, it hasn't added up anything yet. It will. Yeah. But, it, but interesting, there's buried in there an instrumental kind of functional argument that is quasi-economic, but it's also, you know, it's a... It's, a, it's an access to justice. It's an access argument. to justice argument that is not necessarily sort of a fundamental rights-based thing, which is actually a very important distinction. I just had a small point. Um, isn't it also the threat of most professionals who stand, you know, usually had access and only had access to this information? For example, realtors um, are threatened by easy access to lots mm -hmm. of uh, online published information. Sure. Um, and so, not every citizen may become an expert in law, real estate, healthcare, but maybe just one or two, and that's one or two more than would have been if there was no access to this. That's fascinating, very good analogy. This occurs to me just as a suggestion, Carl. If we're thinking in really functional terms about sending a document to law school deans, one thing one might do would be anticipate in an FAQ for the faculty members who are going to get the pushback from the dean or the should I do this from the dean, what are the questions you can anticipate from your alums, right? One, I think, might be this argument that says um, you're ruining the profession, right? You are not, in fact, helping the um, very profession that um, feeds supports in which you are um, grounded because you are breaking down um, the barriers between us and our clients and so forth. And, and I think having an argument in an FAQ that, you know, a one paragraph, no, that's actually totally faulty, you know, see Tom Bruce, see Richard Susskind, you know, whatever the right way to put that is might be really useful. And it sounds like spiking the FAQ, but then as the document circulates and we hear the questions coming back, it's exactly, yeah. so the next dean it iterates and for the next dean you've yeah, you got suggestion. Yeah. So a, a standard gloss, yeah, if you will. Standard gloss is yeah. your point. Yep. I just want to annotate what, what I'm saying is I mean, you're focusing on the law school dean thing, but even you're talking about congressional appropriations. I mean, I'm, I'm from New York, and the tr trial lawyers in New York are a very powerful force in yeah. Albany. And one of them is the head of the assembly, frankly. Sure. 
Um, and I'm sure that's true in a lot of other states. So I'm just saying, uh, even on the government level, when you're trying to get this appropriated or policy-wise, you're also going to you're going to face this as a as a, a lobbying. The deans are audience yeah. one, but then there is the judicial conference yeah. and the Congress, and as you point out, the ABA. Right. And we're just beginning to engage with the ABA, and they're just beginning to pay attention to this. And, right. and, that's, and, the, that's, and, the, and that's the only reason I raised the issue. No, it's very good. And the law school deans' audiences, the people they have to listen to and answer to, are often these people in our profession too. Brett, right. I think you know one one answer to this uh, to this argument that, that you're, you're taking power away from lawyers is that it's really you're just shifting. The basis for which to value lawyers, yeah. um, and it's not so much now about who can who can access the written documents um, or who can access the most accessible written documents, but rather who's uh, who's got the expertise, who's got the experience, the background. Yeah, totally right. advocate. I mean, this, uh, if you haven't read Richard Susskind's book, The End of Lawyers, you ought to. This is one of the key arguments that he makes, and he makes in his consulting to big law firms, is to say, look, what's shifting here is where the value is in terms of what lawyers actually provide. Um, and I think it also encompasses this argument that giving people just access to the raw material of the law itself doesn't make people lawyers. It, you know, it's not actually that helpful in some respects. You have to put a lot more context in. Um, and if that's all it takes, then the profession has a bigger problem than anything. So let me shift gears in the next uh, sort of uh, 12 or so minutes that we have to the um, uh, arguments number uh, two and three. Starting with argument number two of the 11 people who said it is in fact a cognizable right and you should be uh, going into court to get it vindicated, um, who will make that case? Who's our constitutionalist here or um, the, uh, the oral argument uh, person? Yes, please. Well, I think it's like uh, the Great. emotional stab, which is if the internet is uh, a right that we're all demanding, then the law on the internet must be as well. And wouldn't it just be wonderfully ironic to watch the Supreme Court decide and haggle over whether the laws of the land actually belong in the public's hands? Okay, so that, that will align into the next um, uh, session, too, about the ownership that, that um, Phil's doing. But um, uh, who, will, who will build on that? Uh, I had other arguments. Yeah, please. Uh, the whole one would be uh, due process. Okay. And, uh, ability, uh, predictability, ability for someone who has charges against them to know what those charges are and the penalties that they could incur, or even just whether or not if you were going to perform a specific action, what the um, chances of you obtain those consequences would be. Yep. Um, and then also, based on something that Carl said yesterday, some of the courts don't have access to their own opinions in their own districts, so it affects the ability of judges to have predictable outcomes for the cases that are before them based on the outcomes that have happened in the past. Um, I think that there's a slightly weaker copyright argument, which is that the Constitution grants it for a limited monopoly uh, for the purposes of innovation and useful sciences. And so a monopoly by government is at least a questionable uh, aspect in the, the climate today. Um, and uh, it's questionable what amount of innovation is being granted by allowing governments to monopolize uh, access to but, and then also something with the Oregon case that Carl was saying, even in a loss, um, it, it raises the public awareness mm -hmm. and uh, there's an opportunity for the courts to at least uh, co-opt the movement, mm -hmm. saying that we support access as well. No, that's absolutely right. If, if Charlie Nesson were here, I wish he were, he would right now, I think, be jumping up and down and saying, you know, absolutely, you bring this in part because you're talking past the justices, right? You bring something that you want to be not frivolous in the sense that it's got to stick in the court and actually be worth doing. But the fact that it's a 20% chance and not 100% chance um, is sort of beside the point. You take this risk, you make the best argument you can, you're a zealous advocate for something you believe in and that is legitimate. Maybe it's a due process claim or, you know, kitchen sink kind of approach. Um, but the point is you're talking to the people, and you're talking to the people through this medium, the cyberspace medium. You go directly to them, and um, you kind of do an end run around it, and you make a, make a movement through that. Uh, two points. One, you have to 11.15. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great, great. Uh, the other is um, the, the uh, let's sue them and bring it up to the courts, what I call the Thoroughgood Marshall strategy, uh -huh. right? Um, let's do this in all sorts of places and bring it up. Um, I can't get sued. And I've tried, and we don't have a significant <laughs> suit um, When we posted all the building codes online, I had EFF representing me, obviously, because we did all the public safety codes for the country. And I did the plumbing codes, right? So we had the Fire Protection Association and the plumbing people and the, the International Code Consortium. I didn't even get a letter 
No. <laughs> All we wanted was a letter saying, you know, what you're doing is wrong, and then we could have gone in for a declaratory judgment. Uh, we've investigated ways of, of suing the courts for their paywalls, but, you know, we just don't have standing. Or at least we've been unable to find it. And so that's something worth considering as, as we look at the legal strategy. We've tried for three years, and I'm, I'm fairly proud of the fact that everything we've done, um, not even a nasty letter, let alone a lawsuit. The closest we got was a takedown notice from Oregon. And even though they said they were going to sue us, it was pretty clear they weren't going to. Uh, we, we threatened to sue them, and they said, well, we don't want to go to court and they help hear it instead. <laughs> so, um, and as you say, Charlie Nesson has, has the point right that often the lawsuits are trying to get over to your point three, which is, you know, even if it's not a constitutional right, it may be a political right. And maybe one is going to the Congress to try to convince them that something needs to be done, or the president, or others in the strict sense of right. Yeah. Well, so I'm not an all lawyer. No, never comes law. So never lawyer. stop many of us. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I like to play. So it's fun. So in, in some ways, this combines my reaction to the principles that Carl talks about. Yeah. You talk about access to the law, but but it, sometimes it sounds like you're talking about access to the law as a document. I think that the, the principle behind that is access to the law as a process, right? What we're talking about, many things we talked about yesterday is, you know, understanding how to, to fill out the form to file a pleading, right? That, even if that form is available, that, people don't have access to law if they don't understand what the words on that form mean. So, you know, the reason that all of this is important is not because we're talking about copyright, right? That's, that's just, that's the thing in the middle of starting from a fundamental princess that all people have access to the law as a process, one of the things that you need to get access to law as a process is a bunch of words that are written down somewhere. That's, that's just one thing of many. So I think as a legal sort of constitutional argument, what you really want to say is sort of a, a Sixth Amendment, you know, Gideon and B. Wainwright argument that says, listen, you know, you have a right to counsel. Why do you have a right to counsel? Because you have a right to a fair trial. You know, access to the law is really just an extension of access to counsel. So I mean, you know, someone's going to talk to you, but you should be able to read it. And, and I, you know, I honestly think this is a natural extension of Gideon B. Wainwright. I mean, that, that's obviously a narrow question of you know, states' rights and individual rights. <laughs> and you've got banks now. So, we that outside. Yeah, made into a wonderful TV movie with Henry Fonda. You know, time to make a decision. Um, and also, sort of, if I can step above one level, why I voted two and not yeah. one or three, I think it's sort of kind of talk against Tom a little is, is I think that you're right that it's, it, it is a many distributed political argument and obviously you should make those arguments, but you're going to make those arguments 17,000 times, every court, every regulation, everything, you over and over again, even when you have a victory, the next day is going to defeat and all, you know, and then someone's going to, the executive director is going to leave and there's going to be a new CIO and they're going to move to Drew Hall and then it's all going to be different. You can fight this again and again and again until you have, you know, Malamud v. somebody, and it's going to be the decision that you can finally, just like Gideon, right, the, the wonderfully named Gideon, that, that lets you, you know, make a TV movie, and like, that's the fact. And every time you walk into someone's room, you can know, say, listen, this is a Gideon right, we need, we need you to do this, and, and they'll say, yeah, we know. And, you know, it never gets up to the court, because every court in the world at that point says, look, this is a Gideon issue, I'm not going to touch this, I'm not going to even listen to the arguments. That's so, yep. Uh, two points quickly. One is that this is just an extension of the long line of cases, original newspapers and all these other cases, having to deal with right of access to the courts. It's just the new way you access the courts. I mean, and there's a long line of cases holding mostly that courts, courts are open and their records have to be available. So that's the first argument. The second just point I want to make is that uh, Thurgood Marshall is a genius to think one. You have to be careful the risk of losing. Oh, yeah. You have to think about what happens if we lose. And I'm not saying don't bring the case, and I voted for this one, but I'm just saying you have to have the contingency plan for what if we lose. Well, that's why you need a lot of cases. You can't just do one because, you know, who knows what a judge is going to rule. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But I'm, I'm, that's it. Oh, yeah. That's it. Uh, so on the question of the losing and the, the Charlie Nesson point that you made, that, that um, having the battle can be worthwhile um, because you can make rhetorical points and make political points. I think um, those arguments might not hold as well here because, um, as Carl was saying, it, it's hard to find a plaintiff. It's hard to find someone, 
who has standing, uh, you know, when, when Billy Ledbetter lost her case, um, she became a goddess of Ledbetter. There's a person that they could, they could name a law after. Um, and so Congress could say, you know, uh, we lost, the Supreme Court ruled this way, uh, we're going we're to change the law. Um, it's hard to, to galvanize a movement um, when, when you can't identify a specific person who suffered a specific problem. Um, so you're anti number two for that reason? I'm anti number two uh -huh. for, for that reason. Uh -huh. So I think there's a lot to be said for Carl's three tier approach, actually. Um, I'm a big fan. I think that you're definitely targeting different audiences with each of these three, the three approaches. Um, number two provides the bite behind the bark, essentially. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, at the same time, I personally voted for number three because I think, uh, like you said yesterday, turn to somebody in a bar and appeal to them with this argument, there is a very broad-based emotional pull that it has. Uh, and I think that's something that shouldn't be understood. Um, I mean, I can speak directly to the, I mean, I think there's a liberty interest as well here mm -hmm. that you have um, a right to interact with your government that provides you a basic right to be a free citizen in a society that needs knowledge of the parameters of that interaction. Um, but I also wanted to draw the analogy to the creation of the CFR. Um, before the CFR existed, regulations happened in Washington. No one had access to them, um, and that's and it was a lawsuit in in that went to the Supreme Court that sparked the, the desire for some sort of nationwide access to regulations, um, and that movement was led by Supreme Court justices and deans of law school. Um, so Who sometimes become Supreme Court justices. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, in the best of circumstances. And, 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 and a personal relationship, one might want to cultivate that to uh, bring the Supreme Court justice on board. Let, let me point out another example of that, which is the, uh, the Government Printing Office was formed in 1861, the day that Abraham Lincoln took office. And it's because the records of the Congress was being published by private publishers. And they weren't doing a good job. They were just doing summaries and they were forgetting debates. And the government decided they needed an official record of the Congress or the Congress wouldn't be legitimate. And so that, that whole CFR thing was actually a repeat of the congressional record thing of, of almost 100 years before that. Wow, history, very useful. Thank well, you. but I guess the, the question is, I mean, that those two movements were both not galvanized by a lawsuit. I, even though I voted for number two, I do think in our society today, it's very helpful to have some sort of opinion to point to and say, you need to do this because it says it here, um, especially with the fragmented um, nature of the, what we want done. Um, it, uh, you know, it might also backfire. You know. I just, sorry. Stephanie, very nice. Thank you. Marnie. Okay, besides the frequently asked questions, I want to say, I think we should have another section about who knew. And some of the anecdotal stuff that's come up around Lexus sitting at the table, or even the, how the CFR was created, actually allows people to plug in in different levels in our past history and what arguments they might need. So besides the sort of technical questions, I think we can have, it's not touchy-feely, but it's not, it's more letting people know there's a whole audience out there looking at this. And we've already got a history of doing this. This isn't radical. We just did it different ways might be fun to put together, whether we send it with the document or not. It's great. I think you just volunteered a uh, another <laughs> workshop. Part. It's great. Others on number two. Tom. I, I just want to tag a couple of things. I may be a little off, 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 off the rails here. That, that, that it's happened. never happened before. No, no. no. That, that will never happen no, again. No. Uh, having to do with the nature of the, the kind of pushback that you're, you're, you're likely to hear, that, that we're likely to hear on this. Um, there is the people will hurt themselves with this argument. Uh, and, and, and on the side of... And on, Unsafe at any speed. Well, yeah, which is also the sort of way of the argument. And, you know, oddly enough, people have been making that argument since Cook. In, in fact, Cook himself makes it uh, in, what, the 17th century. Uh, that, that, if you, that if you publish this stuff, people are going to harm themselves. And, you know, the bodies are not littered in the streets as yet. Uh, and one of the reasons that I think that I gravitate away from highly dramatic arguments about this stuff is that it is so very everyday and it does function so very well on an everyday basis, right? I mean, if you sit in a room full of law professors and you say, look, there's nothing in the ADA that a carpenter can't understand. 
uh, and a lot of things that a carpenter needs to, uh, they'll look at you and say, well, what about reasonable accommodation? You know, just to show that they were paying attention. And, and <laughs> the, the, the only answer to that is really, uh, you know what? The vast majority of people in this country do not spend all day dealing in edge cases uh, on the constitutional side of, of the legal system. They're just trying to build ramps or, or whatever. Uh, and if you really believe that it is impossible for people to make use of this information, it's, it, it would be, it, you know, if that were true, economic life in this country would grind to a halt. In about, two, in about two days. It's a wonderful point. The, in Massachusetts, for those who uh, live here, uh, about two months ago, I guess it was March 1st, a new rule went into place, which was the mass privacy regs, and any entity of any sort, including a um, university or business or whatever, had to come into compliance with this thing on, on March the 1st. And it was exactly as you're describing. Everybody had to build a ramp, right? You had to figure out what to do. Um, and it turns out, uh, relative of mine is president of a little nursery school. They have no, you know, basically no formal staff, but they had to figure out how to comply. And you go on the internet, it's, you know, February the 28th, like everybody else, you have to comply tomorrow. What are you supposed to do? And the difficulty of getting the basic information of that sort in terms of how to comply was extraordinary. I sat there with her as a you know, law professor, much less you know, and somebody who cares about privacy, right? This is sort of my field. Um, and actually parsing that was really hard to figure out what this nursery school had to do the next day. Um, but so I actually think, I, I flip this back to what you're saying, which is I think we could solve for a lot of the you know 90% problems, the 99% problems, and you're quite right. Obviously, the most interesting reasonable accommodation type things are, in fact, what lawyers should be doing, right? Or the um, Richard Suskin type lawyers should be doing. It's interesting. Others on number two. Anyone want to make a forceful, yes, we should do it, go for it type argument? Seems like there's some people who think we should, but it's uh, it's not as not as held with great conviction as I might have thought. All right, on to number three. So this one being the yes, it's a right, but not in the uh, bring it to the Supreme Court kind of way. Who wants to make the case for this? Yes, Meg. Excellent. Cold calling was about to begin. So <laughs> you spared yourself and others. So I really like. Them. And what's the it? Uh, well, what we're doing now, figuring it out, figuring uh -huh. out what the priorities are, where to start, who to involve. Uh -huh. um, I don't know, as a new librarian, I sometimes think librarians have talked too long, and <laughs> we're all talk, and we can never make a decision and just do something, and that drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. So, but your point is, yes, there are these rights, but don't foreground them. Foreground the doing part, and when you need it, roll out some of these rights-based arguments, but they're not the... The centerpiece of the Yeah, I mean, if they could prone Carl and have another Carl pursuing that side of things, that would be awesome. Uh -huh. uh, that'll take them over. You don't have a brother or anything. <laughs> I do believe he's a geophysicist. I see, I see. I'm sure he's an excellent geophysicist. Yeah. We'll send him a note and see if he wants to go to law school. Marty? Uh, well, I want to go back to what something you already said, which is ignorance of the law is no excuse. Yeah. And that uh, we sort of, as a common society, say that. and. Just to give you a visual image, and I told my staff this week, is I'm part of my crime watch. And it turned out that the neighborhood, the probation officer was sending the kids who were trespassing to the crime watch for the organizational meeting so we could get to know each other. So I had the kids who were trespassing, the landlords, the DA, the police who arrested him, and then other people. And one of the kids said, I want to see the trespassing law so I know whether or not I'm doing it. And the cops said, good idea. And I said, well, there's this website that you all saw yesterday. <laughs> and sure enough, I gave it out. Everybody's head went down to write it out. And I, I wish I had had it on video because, you know, it was the landlord, the police, the DA, the kid asking for it. And it was a great visual image. All we wanted was the trespassing law. But there is a need for the right to the law among everybody. And um, I don't know how you visually paint that in the argument, but that's the argument. Um, Can you, Marty, go back to something that was discussed in the last session, part or last sort of segment? Um, I heard a really interesting distinction between access to the law as such, the access to the law as information, 
versus access to the law as process, access to the law in the sense of justice, maybe, to, to bring it up one level. Um, are you talking about access to the information um, as such, or is it is it bigger than that in the way that you're no, conceptualizing? I, right now, I am just saying yes, again, yeah. because I like the argument down here about where we said about access to the documents. Yeah. That gets us out of some of this, you know, you're taking away my rights as a lawyer, my rights as a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> my right to be a lawyer, and to exclude other people from my fabulous profession. <laughs> I mean, my first argument would be, let's get the rights to the document. We really don't care what people do with that information. I mean, what we want are rights to the document. Then the next concentric circles are how do people do with that. But I think it gets us out of a lot of the arguments that we're bringing up, which is all we want is the right to the document. That's really interesting. So even rhetorically, you would frame it at the lower level, so access to justice and access to sort of the processes up here, and access to the information as such as here, you would aim at this this kind of lesser included piece, but which is somehow more concrete, more visible. Because uh, if you achieve that, yeah. then the next one. Yeah. Really interesting. Michelle. Oh, I was a one in three person. Uh -huh. All right. uh, and I look at this from a very practical perspective of marketing this in a sense to the groups we want to market to for students and then other people. And that's why I left out too, and not completely against it, but I, when I think it energy and resources, what we want to spend our time on, I'm not sure, too, is the best place. I do think it, to market it to some of these groups, one and three are our best arguments. Um, and I think that number, the number three, you know, there's a lot going on internationally in different foreign venues about the whole concept of right to information as like a human right. Mm -hmm. And I think that does pull in some of sort of the fundamental rights issues you get in number okay. two. But I think combining one and three, I think three is broad enough. I think. You need three with some groups like Dean's Law Schools because you want to bring up some of these issues that make it more tangible and bring in these issues about larger concerns about society. But I think when you bring in number two with it being a strict fundamental right, yeah. then sometimes people aren't willing to go there or commit to that. But that brings in the people that might sort of see it as a fundamental mm -hmm. right that kind of make the argument in number two with court cases. Um, they should have the best of both worlds. I think that's a nice, nice gloss on, on Marnie's argument, and sort of with my international law hat on, you know, thinking about, I was going to push on, um, is there a point of going to the sort of universal human rights level, right, of, of an argument of getting out of the American exceptionalism or the Massachusetts exceptionalism, for that matter, or the agency exceptionalism, and, and going one level more abstract. But I, I want to just actually ask, for one in three years, one could make the argument they are mutually exclusive, right? The number one is no, it's not actually a right. We should use these other arguments. And three is yes, it is, but not in a in a um, sort of a court-based sense. Is it the point that you want to argue in the alternative, in that you, what you want to do is to say um, uh, you could have it either way. You could have it with the right or without a right. And you know we're going to argue first. Yes, it is a right. Here are the things. Um, but even if you don't agree with us about that, we've got all these other arguments. I take it that that's... I only did one year in law school, yep. but I thought that's how you frame your arguments, got it. right? <laughs> <laughs> got it. Got it. I just want to be sure. I just want to be sure that's what we're talking about. Tom. Yeah, because, I mean, on a, on a very practical level, you can say, well, look, people are saying this and people are saying that. But one thing that everyone can agree on is that the ability to comply with federal regulations is a good idea. Yep. You know, whether you're the one enforcing or, or you're, you're the one who's being ground under their boot. Yep. You know. <laughs> Others. Just to get back to two, um, in these days of budget um, cuts, don't you want to have some place you can point where you say, um, I don't care that your budget is being cut this year. This is something that you have to do. Um, it's part of what we do to um, ensure that our citizens uh, are granted this right. Um, and I think we're always going to be in a situation where you know you go to an a, a low-level agency in a state system, um, and you you know they're not going to want to provide the information because there's a um, startup process. The know. Attorney General of Oregon, <coughs> after we did the legislature, I kind of adopted Oregon. And, um, <laughs> the Attorney General's uh, public meeting manual is an official Attorney General opinion, and he asserted copyright on it. And so we, needless to say, made a copy of it, put it in front of the net. Um, and I ended up with a phone call with the Attorney General because he was getting a whole bunch of bad press. And he goes, you know, the issue to me is not whether this should be public or not. The issue to me is it's $40,000 to make this manual. I'd love to make it public, but I have to go to the legislature and ex explain to them, 
you know, now we discussed whether that 40 grand was printing costs and could they do it cheaper and all that, but to him it was just a money issue. State of California, same thing, they get $800,000 a year for the California Code of Regulation as a royalty from the vendor. So, you know, even if you want to give it up, they got to go to the bu you know, budget process. So, um, yeah, having a little more than simply it's a good idea would be nice. Uh, the you have to do this would, would certainly be a, uh, a helpful thing. Whether we can achieve that or not, I don't know. Uh, we might be able to achieve the moral you have to do this, which is the President of the United States or the Chief Justice standing up and saying this is a good idea. Well, that's not binding, obviously, but it, it certainly helps. Michelle? Sure. You have to do that, this argument. Are there other ways to do that besides courts? <laughs> do you know what I mean, like country policy, like in terms of through the legislature? Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, uniform, uniform yeah. laws, uh, right. commission. Executive right. order by I mean. the President so there are other ways in this first week. Yeah. <laughs> Go that route, maybe, without necessarily doing the courts as a yeah. Kim? Um, I have to admit that my heart lies with number two. No doubt. You're <laughs> former legal aid lawyer, you but. cost lawyer, Kim Doolin. <laughs> But one of the things I like about three is Carl, yeah, you can argue the alternative and all that kind of stuff, so I always go for that. But the mushy answer could um, take advantage of lots of things that you could use in your arguments. And one of the things that occurred to me is the fear factor. If we don't take care of this ourselves, government, the private sector may not. You know, I know that they, they have a monetary interest, but we, we talk about this all the time with preservation issues. If we don't preserve our own material, what happens if the private sector decides not to publish it anymore, it becomes too expensive. So that's sort of a grassroots argument, I think. But that's a really good one. I admit it, when we're having those preservation conversations, I'm sympathetic and I think they're very important. Part of me wants to see one of these companies fail and what would happen, yeah. right? It's almost like you want to see that in part to say who would rush in and pick up the pieces or would somebody not and is you know what kind of a forcing function it's like the reverse of competition when competition fails what then what sort of fills that particular void that's a really really good point I mean the answer in some ways is Tom Bruce right I mean the, the, in the failure of the government to do that Tom Bruce rushed in the answer I hate to contemplate the problem uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 this would be an interesting time to look at who's being served. Uh, because we do have this kind of incomplete coverage now, and it's skewed in various areas of the system, right? I mean, the law of deep pockets has always been available for West Law devices. But it is a hell of a lot easier to find stuff about securities regulation than it is to, for example, get the municipal dog law in, in Binghamton, New York. I know because I tried. Uh, or, or to deal with your, your, your ramp at the, at, at the nursery right. school. On the other hand, at the very lowest level, the municipal level, there are private sector actors who have sort of stepped in there and are doing a good job. So I'm sort of thinking at the moment that the skew is away from people who are at the kind of lower middle portion of the, of the, of the court hierarchy. And, and this is one reason why it's always seemed particularly useless to me to talk about putting Supreme Court decisions up. Somebody's going to do that. Uh, the real question is who's going to do, I don't know, the third administrative district in New York? Um, <coughs> Because I'm not sure that the private sector will step in. Uh, I don't. I guess what I'm saying is I don't know that we have to wait for a company to crash. I, I, I may have seen it earlier already. I think there are plenty of underserved areas now. That's fascinating. Oh, uh, last comment from Stephanie. Then. Sorry. I mean, the, the example of the Boston Police Code comes, or rules comes to mind because you know, having looked for it ten years ago and trying to look for it now, I believe that there was some legal action taken to make that be now publicly available. Because if they don't, how are you going to bring a 1983, Section 1983 case if you don't know that they have to follow their own procedures? And before, you had to actually physically go to their office to, to get those documents and sometimes, because they didn't update the library version very frequently. So, I mean, again, that speaks for some sort of legal action. That's good. I want to keep us on time. Um, this is actually totally instructive to me, crowdsourcing a constitutional argument. I, I like it. This was fun, like a, like a class. Um, I'm actually left, in a way, most persuaded by uh, a version of what Meg Cribble said a few minutes ago, which is um, it, it is crucial to make these arguments, to frame them out, to be good lawyers about it. Um, at the same time, we have to just do it, right? And I think in, in many respects, having 
um, uh, Carl here and Tom Bruce and others who have been just doing it as well as uh, as well as making these arguments is uh, deeply inspiring. So thank you for this. This was great. And do uh, we have a break or what? What do you go on next to? Uh, break, Phil. All right. So let me introduce my uh, friend and colleague Phil Malone, uh, professor here at Harvard Law School, director of the Cyber Law Intellectual Property.